Let's pray. Our Lord, as we bring our praises to you today, we're mindful that the same Lamb on the throne is the Lord Jesus, who we welcome into our midst this morning. Lord, we rejoice today, even though we're not worthy to be in your presence, yet you invite us in. And we can't imagine just how awesome you are, the one who is worthy of all power and wealth and might and glory and honour and blessing. And yet, Lord, you're the one who promises in your word to never leave us, to never forsake us. You're the one who's brought us into your family so that we can know God as our loving Father, Jesus as our elder brother, embraced in the love and power of the Holy Spirit. Father, we praise you that we're loved by you, that we belong to you, that we've been rescued by you, and for this we praise you today. We give you thanks that you're building your church, that hearts and minds turn to you every single day, that all over the world your kingdom is expanding. But Lord, we long for the day when you make all things new, when we see you face to face. Thank you that in the meantime, whether the sun is shining down on us or whether we find ourselves in difficulties in the wildernesses of this life, that you're always here, closer than a brother. But Lord, as we wait for the day when we join with that multitude around your throne, we're aware of the brokenness and sin in our lives. Lord, we realise that we still live with sin which so easily entangles us. At times we find ourselves still inclined to live for ourselves and not for you, not for those you've called us to serve. We're quick to speak words which harm and are unkind rather than words which build up and bless. So easily we fall into sin. But thank you that you do not treat us as our sins deserve, but instead you give us your grace. You treat us as a loving father treats his children, at times disciplining us for our good, but always loving us, always forgiving us, and always embracing us. Thank you that Jesus has made a way for us to know you, to be part of your kingdom, and we pray that even as we praise you today, as we meet together, as we hear from your word, that you would build your kingdom, and may the name of Jesus be lifted high in this place today, and we pray in his name. Amen. We join together to sing again to focus our hearts and our minds on our Lord Jesus uh, in the words of our next song, All I Want's Held Dear. <laughs>
Paul uh, of announcements this morning, and then Hazel is going to come uh, and make an announcement as well. Uh, we meet again at this evening at 7 p.m., uh, and we're going to be beginning a series this evening looking at the Lord's Prayer um, and thinking about how that can shape how we pray. So I encourage you to come along uh, again this evening. And then just a reminder that our minister, Marty, is away at the moment studying. Uh, so if you do need to get in touch, uh, if you need anybody, you can contact me. And you can also contact our club of session, Dennis Marriott. Uh, and Marty will be back with us next Sunday. Here's all I'm going to hand over to you. Morning, everybody. Um, apologies, my voice isn't great today, but I've got a microphone here. Um, as some of you maybe know, I'm a designated person in the congregation for um, ch taking care, and that's the role of looking after child protection. And uh, one of those roles I have is to organise training for leaders and helpers and organisations uh, to make sure that we are up to date with legislation on what we need to do to protect ourselves and protect our children and young people when they come to activities in the church. So with that in mind, um, I've arranged training on Wednesday the 1st of February at half past seven. Um, I would really like to stress it's really important that everybody who's involved in children's and young people's work attends on that evening. I'm putting a three line map out there. I might have to excommunicate you if you don't come. <laughs> but um, So the 1st of February, Wednesday night, uh, and there's a trainer coming from PCI. It takes a couple of hours and they take us through all the different elements of uh, child protection. Um, folk will also be joining us from uh, St Andrews Presbyterian, so there should be a good number of us there that night. If you're involved in any aspect of the work from crash right through to young life, um, would you make sure that you tell other folk, anybody who's not here today or maybe hasn't got our newsletter about the training and hopefully we'll see you all then. If you can't come for a legitimate reason, um, will you please speak to me because I'll try and arrange for you to attend training at another local congregation in the next few weeks. So it's Wednesday the 1st of February, 7.30 and hope we'll see you then. Thanks. Thanks so much Hazel and uh, yeah I know sometimes when we hear child protection training we're tempted to roll our eyes and think oh I'll have to sit through that again but it's so important that we do that uh, to keep ourselves right and to look after the young people uh, in our care. Um, and so now in our prayers of intercession, we're going to pray particularly for our work among children and young people. So let's pray together. Our God and our Father, as we've just been reminded of a practical element of our work with children and young people, we do want to bring before you just now all the work that is done in your name in this place that seeks to care for them and to bring them the good news of what Jesus has done for them. Lord Jesus, we're reminded that when the disciples thought that you would be too busy to see the young ones, that you made time for them. And you taught the disciples to let them come to you, and you spent time with them, and you blessed them. And so, Lord, as your disciples today, help us to let the children come to you. Help us to point them to you. Help us to pass our faith on to them. Lord, we bring before you the work of the boys and girls' brigades in this place. Thank you for the lives impacted by them over many years here. We ask that you would continue to bless them as they reach the current generation. We pray too for the work of young life here that Hazel mentioned. And Lord, when that work is challenging, we ask that you would give the leaders strength and wisdom to reflect the life of Christ as they serve. For the work here on Sundays, in Shine and in Forged and in the press, we pray that lives would be impacted as your word is explored there. And as we've been reminded about the child protection training, we do ask that all the work here would know your blessing and your protection. Lord, we pray for safety in that work and just that it would all be done in the best possible way. But far above all that, that many young lives would know the newness of life that comes from knowing you, Jesus, in saving faith. Lord, we also bring before you our local schools and we ask that they would be places where the pupils would be able to flourish. We pray for the staff there and all the work that they do. And we're thankful for the opportunities that Dan has in particular to serve in Nettlefield and in Breda Academy. 
And we ask for your presence with him in that and in the course we're up here. Again, Lord, we pray that the fruit of that, whether directly or through invitations to your life, would be lives won for the Saviour. And Lord, whatever stage of life we're at this morning, whether we're young and studying or if those days are behind us, Lord, we praise you that you're always faithful in every stage and every season of our lives. And we read in your word that we have the invitation to cast our anxieties and our burdens on you because you care for us. And we name these problems now in our hearts. And we ask that as we do so, we would know a lighter burden as we cast them on you. Help us to trust. Help us to let go of our desire to go it on our own without you. And help us to walk in the days ahead in dependence on our Lord and Saviour. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. And um, those of you who are in Forged um, can go out at this stage. That's if you're in uh, P7 through to Year 9, so you can uh, head on out. We're going to turn uh, at God's Word now uh, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Uh, I invite you to take a pew Bible, and it's on page 1186. We're beginning a, a new series this morning um, in 1 Thessalonians. We're actually going to go through both 1st and 2nd Thessalonians over the next uh, number of weeks. And we're going to think um, about how the, the gospel impacts our lives and how it completely uh, changes our lives and turns them around. And so we're going to uh, read uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Uh, just now, Paul is writing to a, a brand new church um, in, in First Thessalonians, as we're going to see. So, we're going to read this together. As I say, it's on page 1186 uh, in the Church Bibles. First Thessalonians chapter 1, and reading from the beginning. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, Grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power with the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you give us. They tell how you turn, from, to, turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. We thank God for his word, and I encourage you to, to keep that open just now, and we'll turn to God and ask him for help as we come to look at his word. Let's pray. Our God, we thank you that you are a speaking God. We thank you most of all for your word incarnate, for Jesus and for his life and his teaching and his death and his resurrection. And as we come now to consider these words written to these brand new Christians, we pray that just as he taught, that you would speak to us again for his sake. Amen. I have always been a big fan of detective stories, particularly uh, of murder mysteries. Uh, so last year I decided to start listening to the audiobooks of Agatha Christie's famous detective, Hercule Poirot. Here's David Suchet playing the part there. Maybe you've seen the TV series, or maybe you're more familiar with uh, Kenneth Branagh's newer film adaptations. Uh, of Murder on the Orient Express and, and Death on the Nile. They're well worth watching. But the novels are fantastic. Um, and believe it or not, on New Year's Eve, I managed to complete the last audiobook. So all the journeys between Ballymure and Ravenhill were well spent. That's 33 full-length novels 
and 50 something short stories, um, all, well, most of it in the car. But one of the many things that um, Poirot is famous for is solving complicated cases, cases that just leave everybody else thinking, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. He employs his brain, or as he says, his little grey cells, and he always arrives at the solution. And when we come to any of Paul's letters in the New Testament, really a bit of detective work is required. Peter says, I think in his second letter, that you know sometimes Paul writes things that are difficult to understand. Uh, he doesn't start them off with a wee note for future generations. By the way, here's what year it is, and here's why I was writing this, and, and what I was thinking at the time. And sometimes it's a bit tricky to know exactly what's going on in these churches, or what issues they're facing, and what people were, were maybe getting wrong in their teaching that Paul wants to correct. So we have to do a little bit of work with our good selves. We need to read what he says, we need to look at church history, and, and in some cases we need to look back in the book of Acts, and then we have to allow the facts, as Paul would say, to arrange themselves uh, in a way that makes sense. So before we jump straight into 1 Thessalonians this morning, and I want us to do just a little bit of background work this morning, not too much, but if I could ask you to keep your thumb in 1 Thessalonians and turn with me to Acts chapter 17. It's on page 1113 um, in the Pew Bible, so it'll be on the screen as well. But we're going to find out together just how this church at Thessalonica came into existence uh, and what Paul had to do with it. So again, we're going to turn to God's Word, uh, this time in Acts chapter 17, on page 1113. When they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women. But the Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they put Jason and the others on bail and let them go. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Many of the Jews believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. When the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God in Berea, they went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The brothers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Then the men who escorted Paul brought him to Athens, and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. Again, we thank God for his word. It's quite a dramatic story, isn't it? The birth of this church in Thessalonica. Paul preaches on three Saturdays, three Sabbath days, and Acts tell us that he explained and he proved from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah, the saviour that the Jewish people were waiting for. And in these three weeks, it's not very long in the life of any church, but we're told that a large number of people came to faith. Verse 4 there, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks, and not a few prominent women. This is a story of God doing something really quite extraordinary, something unexpected, something wonderful. Paul preaches in the synagogue, so presumably he was trying to reach the Jews primarily, and some Jews were persuaded, but many more Greeks and these prominent women. 
These women, if they were prominent women, that would suggest that they were Roman rather than Greek or Hebrew, and that fits in kind of with the aristocracy of the time. And from what we know historically about the city of Thessalonica, it was a multicultural place, so that would make sense. So this church is springing up. Thessalonica has gone from having no Christians to having loads of Christians almost overnight. But disaster strikes for Paul pretty soon. The Jews don't like what he's doing. They go to Jason's house to try and get him, but they don't find him. So they drag Jason and the other Christians before the city officials and they say, these men are trouble. They're causing problems here. And the words literally say they've turned the world upside down. They're saying there's another king. And so the crowd is an uproar. And then in verse 10, we see as soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away. He had to flee by cover of darkness. It probably wasn't Paul's plan, but there it is. He goes with Silas to Berea. Again he preaches. Again there's trouble. The, the troublemakers from Thessalonica come down to Berea. And again he has to leave. Timothy has joined them again by this stage. This time he leaves Silas and Timothy behind. And so he goes to Athens. So there he is, all on his own in Athens. It's about 50 AD, we think. He's had to flee from two churches that he's just planted. It's not exactly a pastor's dream. One he we had three weeks with. The other, we don't even know how long, but probably less. And he's worried about them. Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians 11 that there's the daily pressure on him of his anxiety for all the churches. Paul has, has a deep love for these new churches that he's planted. And you can understand why he would be anxious, can't you? I mean, there's going to be fairly hefty persecution. Paul had to flee in the middle of the night. And they're brand new Christians. Are they going to be able to stand up to this? Are they going to have what it takes to keep following Jesus in the face of such strong opposition? You just see Paul waiting anxiously for Silas and Timothy to, to get to him with news about how these new churches are doing. And Paul gets his answer from Timothy. If we go back to 1 Thessalonians, that's our time in Acts finished this morning, we, we do see in chapter 3 and verse 6, but Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. Paul must have been overjoyed by the news. He must have wondered if the church would have survived at all. And here comes Timothy with this amazing report. I imagine he was thrilled. And that's the context in which he writes this letter. It's a brand new church. It's under a lot of pressure. It's being accused of spreading ideas that are dangerous and disruptive in society. So it makes sense that when we read it, there's, there's three big ideas throughout this letter. And, and the first is simply a loud note of encouragement. Paul wants to encourage these new Christians. And we're going to see that today in chapter 1. Then there's some instructions about discipleship, how to make new disciples, and how to grow as a disciple. Again, these are new Christians, so that makes sense. And then thirdly, there's some teaching about the end times, uh, and about those Christians who've already gone ahead of us to be with the Lord. Now, that might seem a, a little out of place. You maybe think that, what's he doing, throwing these new believers in at the deep end with all this stuff? But I imagine this is what they had loads of questions about. It was probably young Timothy who brought these questions to Paul. You know, Paul, these new churches, they're doing great, but they've all these hard questions about death and, and what happens. Would you maybe write and explain to them a wee bit? So, there it is, 1 Thessalonians. That's our detective work done for today. As a brand new church, they're in a very difficult context. They're being persecuted. They have all kinds of questions for Paul. Their pastor has had to flee for his life. And I wanted to do that this morning just to, to lay the groundwork. You might find it useful later on in the series to, to look up our podcast or just today's service on YouTube to remind yourself uh, of, of how we're coming to study this letter. So as we're going to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and, and focus on that, uh, but we're going to uh, break for a moment just to sing uh, and ask the Lord to speak to us as we do that. We're going to sing together one of the, the newer songs we've learned, Ancient Words.
being read or here, uh, hopefully we, we feel like we know the first, well, we know these first Christians a little bit, uh, those in Thessalonica. And this is the first thing they would have heard from Paul, and the first message he wants to give them is one of encouragement. These guys are bound to have had lots of questions. They're bound to have had doubts, because this is all very new to them. And in becoming Christians, they've put themselves in the firing line. I mean, Jason and some of the others have already been pulled up before the city rulers and accused and bailed. We don't know what happened to them. And people said that they were dangerous. These people are talking about a new king. These people are bad for our country. They're bad for our society. They're against Caesar. And I think we might just be able to, re to uh, relate to that. A generation ago, our toughest challenge as a church was that people thought we were stupid, really, for believing in God. Many people outside church tried to use science to try and say that, that we were silly, really, for believing in God. Uh, and if you were here last Sunday night, you would have heard our, our guest, Chris, uh, talk about the Enlightenment in the 18th century and, and the effect that still does have today. But if you know me, you'll, you'll know my background is in science, and I firmly believe that um, exploring the world that God has made um, in science and having faith don't stand against one another at all. They go together very well. But that's not the biggest challenge we face as a church anymore. Today our biggest challenge is that many people are being led to think that our beliefs are dangerous, that they're bad for society, that they shouldn't be heard or tolerated. Lots of people think that rather than being those who love our neighbours, that, that we're filled with hate. We believe that marriage is instituted by God, it's between a man and a woman, and people hear that and they just conclude that we hate gay people. Now they're putting two and two together and getting five, just because we believe that marriage is between a man and a woman, doesn't mean that we hate anybody who disagrees with that. But that's the narrative. And sadly some Christians haven't helped us, they, they've fueled that by doing hateful things. But most of us don't hate anybody, but we're branded homophobic. In the same way, we believe that God made humanity in his image, male and female, he created them, the Bible says. And so people say we're transphobic, that we hate people who disagree, and again, that's not true. We don't hate anybody, we're not meant to hate anybody who struggles with their gender identity. We don't hate people who want to define gender in a different way, but we're tired with that brush. So I think we have quite a lot in common with these Thessalonian Christians because they were being attacked and, and were being told that they were bad, what they believed was bad for society, it shouldn't be tolerated. And maybe some of us do have those questions. Maybe some of us have listened to that criticism of the church on those issues or on others. And maybe subtly some of us have slipped into believing some of what the world says about it. Maybe some of us are tempted to concede on some of those issues where the world finds that the Bible's teaching is unpalatable. And Paul writes to people like this. He wants to encourage them in the midst of these sorts of accusations and these doubts about what they believe. And he writes, and in this first chapter, he gives them four encouragements. He encourages them that their faith is real, that their faith is for God, that their faith is true, and that their faith gives them eternal hope. And so for us as believers, these four encouragements also encourage us. And if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus just yet, well, these four things are characteristics of what your life will look like if you turn from your sin and follow him. So this first encouragement is that their faith is real. And Paul is thankful for this. Look again at, at verses 2 and 3. In 1 Thessalonians 1, Paul says, We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before God, our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now here we have these three core components of what it is to be a Christian. Faith, hope, and love. Paul mentions them here. We think this is probably the, the first time he mentions them. He mentions them in 1 Corinthians 13 uh, as well. Famously, that chapter, love is patient, love is kind, and so on. You've probably heard it at a wedding. And he says at the end of time when everything is gone, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. Now, 
Now, unhelpfully in our Bible, 1 Corinthians comes first. He actually didn't write to the Corinthians to a good bit later. And we think this is the first time Paul mentions them. This is the first letter we think that Paul wrote to any church. And he starts with this, these three gifts that God gives to his people when he saves them. And these gifts that he later says will stand the test of time. And he says to the Thessalonians, your faith is real. You have these and you have proof of it. You have the work produced by faith. You have your labor prompted by love and your endurance, your perseverance inspired by hope in Jesus. There's proof, there's evidence in your life that these things are real. Even as young Christians, you've already persevered in the face of much opposition. And if you're here today and you're feeling those attacks of the world or if you've questions about, well, is it all real? Is, is my faith really real? Well, one answer would be to look at your life and look for these things. Now, none of us are perfect yet. None of us have stopped sinning yet. But if you're here today and you're actually engaging and you're actually listening to what God is saying through the word, even at this moment, well, that's evidence that your faith is real. The fact that you're here. The fact that you might be serving in some way. It might look very exciting and it might be very spiritual looking at times, but it is a work of faith. There are many other places you could be this morning. If you serve in some way, if, if you give of your time to the work of the Lord, that's a labor prompted by love. The fact that you haven't given up yet, it might be tough. You might think that you don't have the, the tools or the argument to defend your faith or to answer the objections of the world, but the fact that you're still here would suggest that you have endurance inspired by hope in Jesus. Maybe for you, you, you see night and day between the time when you didn't believe in Jesus and the time in your life now when you do. Think about how you want to pray, how you want to spend time in his word. You might have mixed success at doing that, and that's understandable, because the Bible tells us that following Jesus in this world will be a battle. But if you're in the battle, that in itself is proof that you see it. So Paul encourages these Christians, and Paul encourages us, look at your lives now. And see that your faith is real. Even if you don't think you're doing that well, look at how different your desires are than they were before. Look at how different your life is from the world around you. Secondly, then, Paul encourages these Thessalonian believers that their faith is from God. Again, verse 4. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us in the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Paul encourages their, the, the, these believers that their faith is real because it is from God. It's come from on high, from the Holy Spirit. Not just words, but power. The Bible is very clear that no one is saved apart from the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit with deep conviction. The Holy Spirit convicts us and convinces us of our sin and of our need for a Savior. And this could only be done by God. Think about it. We read together in Acts 17 that some Jews believed. But apart from the intervention of God, there would have been really no reason for them to believe. Their religious leaders had put Jesus to death as a disruptor, as a con man. Here was a man claiming to be God, claiming to be able to forgive sins. He was supposed to be the king. And yet he hadn't managed to get rid of the Romans at all. There was no Israelite king on the throne, certainly not him. And apart from the work of God, they'd have had no reason really to believe it. Even more so with the many Greeks and, and these prominent Roman women who believed. We're maybe so used to the story that we don't quite see it. But for them to put their faith in Jesus on a human level would be absolutely ridiculous. The Greeks and Romans worshipped and served many gods. And if the gods were happy with you, if you pleased them, they'd give you success. So if you pleased the gods of fertility, they would reward you with a family. If you pleased the gods of rain, then, well, you the weather would be good to you, you'd get a good crop and you would do well. If you pleased the gods of vitality, you'd live a good long life. If you appeased the gods of thunder and of war, then you would have peace and prosperity. That's what they believed. 
And yet here was this man who had endured persecution and suffering, who had been beaten beyond recognition and crucified, and who died the most agonizing death, and they were supposed to believe that he was some kind of God, some kind of savior, some kind of master who they should worship. From their perspective, it was laughable. He couldn't have made something like that up. From a human perspective, it didn't make sense. And yet there they were, with their hope in a crucified man. The modern songwriter Graham Kendrick has put it like this. He says, I've placed all my hope in a crucified man, in the wounds in his side, his feet in his hands. I have traded my pride for a share in his shame, and the glory that one day will burst from his pain. I've abandoned my trust in the wise and the proud for this fragile, mysterious weakness of God. And I dare to believe in his scandalous claim that his blood cleanses sin for whoever will call on his name. To Romans and Greeks, you couldn't have made up something that flew more in the face of their worldview, of their belief system than that. And what was more, they knew that in following Jesus, they were signing up for hardship and persecution too. Humanly speaking, it just doesn't make sense. It would be impossible. Nobody would believe it. Nobody would buy it. But they didn't just receive the words of the gospel, which would have been laughed at on a human level, but they received those words with power, with Holy Spirit conviction. Even today, if you look at the places where the church is growing fastest today, it's the places where it's most depressed. It's in Afghanistan and China and North Korea. Who would be a Christian in any of those places? Hey guys, I've got the best news for you, but we have to talk about it in secret. And if we get found out, you might get arrested and tortured and possibly worse. Are you? Who would sign up for something like that? Even though Northern Ireland isn't like that, if you're a believer today, you've overcome the arguments of the world around us in a way that only the power of the Holy Spirit could achieve. I grew up in the church. My dad was an elder and mum was the organist, so we were pretty committed. We were fairly, we were the stereotype of a church going family, if you like. I was in the CE, the BB, the youth club, the youth fellowship. I went to the midweek. Sometimes I participated musically. I worked on the sound desk and I was even part of the bowling club. I was never out of the place. I must have heard the gospel hundreds of times. But for a long time, I didn't understand it. I knew the story. I, I knew I was meant to follow Jesus. I knew that should make my life look different, but I just messed up all the time. I was pretty wicked as a person, and even worse, I thought, because God had all these rules that, that I just kept breaking. And, and so fair enough for people who don't go to church, because why would they do any better than that? They, they don't know any better. So I struggled with guilt for many years because I knew the right way to live, I thought. And, and I wasn't living up to it. Until one day, when my minister explained the gospel in the sermon. Now, I'm sure he'd done it hundreds of times before, and he's probably done it hundreds of times since. I was about 16, but for the first time, I was convicted of my sin, really. I realized that I didn't have to pay the price for my sins with a good life, but that somebody had already paid the price for me with a perfect life. And he loved me and he died for me and I didn't have to earn that life by trying. I didn't have to earn his love by trying, but he loved me anyway. And all I had to do was accept the free gift of grace. I'm quite sure that my minister didn't use any words that day that he hadn't used many times before. But that day I heard not just the words, but words with power, with the Holy Spirit, with deep conviction. And it could only have been God. And it changed my life. So we're encouraged that our, our faith is real because we see the evidence and our faith is from God. And then thirdly, that our faith is true. Now, it would be easy, wouldn't it, for me to stand up here uh, as a minister and say, yeah, the Bible's true. And if you're not a Christian today, well, you know, I'm telling you my faith's real and that other believers' faith is real. But why would you believe me? Why would you take my word for that? I mean, I might have convinced myself, but why should I convince you? Well, Paul says that we can verify our faith and we can verify that it's true because we're part of something bigger than just ourselves. 
It's not that John McCracken says that it's true, or even that Paul says it's true, but that the whole church testifies that it's true. Again from verse 6, you became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit, and so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Friends, not only can you see the change in your life, not only can you look back maybe and see how it must have been the Holy Spirit working in you because of our own reason and, and the reason of the world, that wouldn't have saved us on its own. But it's also true that the church testifies that what you believe is true. And that does mean something. These young Thessalonian believers, they were young in faith, I mean, they changed so much that all the believers in the surrounding areas, Macedonia and Achaia, they were all talking about it. Now today we're part of a church that is 2,000 years older than this one. And generation after generation testifies that our faith is true. Generation after generation has looked at new believers and has rejoiced that their faith is true and that they're saved and made alive by the Spirit of God. I came into Ravenhill as an outsider um, almost four years ago now, and I'm so blessed and encouraged by all of you. I know that you're not perfect, you don't claim to be, and uh, good news, I'm not either. But it's so clear that God has been at work here. Now it wouldn't happen, it wouldn't have happened if it weren't for the intervention of God. Many of you have been here for, for many years, and for whatever reasons there might be, God and his sovereignty didn't add to the numbers being saved here for a long, long time. And yes, there have been some changes implemented by human beings, but none, none that would account for the transformation here. It can only happen if the gospel is true and our faith is real. And believers in other places are talking about it. Have you heard what the Lord's doing at Raven Hill? It's only by the fact that it is true that it is real. The church testifies that our faith is real. And then Paul concludes this sentence because actually all of chapter 1 in the original language is one sentence that's very typical of Paul. He concludes in verse 10, and you wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescued us from the coming wrath. These new Christians understandably had questions about the end. Paul actually mentions it in every chapter in this letter, so it is a big theme in the book. Maybe when we think about our faith, and as the world questions that faith, we might be tempted to think, is he really coming back? Do I really go to him after death? Is he really going to come in the clouds in the sky? Because humanly speaking, that, that sounds a bit unlikely. But Paul's answer to that is, Absolutely, yes. If you can be sure that your faith is real when you see the transformation in your life, if you're convinced that the faith is from God because the words on their own wouldn't have convinced you, so they must have come with power, with the Holy Spirit of deep conviction, and if the church testifies that your faith is true, then it follows that this Jesus who died for you and rose again won't let you die. He won't fail you at death. We wait for his return and we're confident that if death meets us before that happens, we're safe in him. And we'll look at that more in future weeks as well. I suppose as we finish this morning, my question is one for you and it's simply this. Do you have that assurance today? Is your faith real from God? True? Does it give you hope beyond death? Or are you with the world? Or are you maybe today convinced for the first time of these words which are not mine, they're God's, with power from the Holy Spirit? Because God's word, the Bible, has a narrative that is different from the world. The Bible's narrative does turn the world upside down. The Bible tells us that this world is heading to a conclusion when Christ returns and we're all judged for all the things we've done in these bodies, good and bad. And outside of Christ, we would approach that day with no hope whatsoever. 
But God, in his great love, has sent his son to live the perfect life we couldn't. So we didn't have to keep on trying in vain to make the perfect standard for that judgment day. We could never do it. So he sent somebody who could. He sent his own son. And he died to pay the price of judgment for our sin. So that if we believe in him, we share in his perfect record. We can know our sins taken away. They're paid for. Punished at the cross. And so we enjoy the hope of sharing in his resurrection life when he returns to judge the world. That's a dreadful prospect if you don't trust the Savior today. I'm not trying to scare you, I'm not trying to manipulate you, but that is a dreadful prospect if what the Bible says is true. But if you do trust him, then there's nothing that could bring you more joy. And you can say with the old hymn, Rejoice in glorious hope. Jesus the judge shall come and take his servants up to their eternal home. We soon shall hear the archangel's voice. The trump of God shall sound. Rejoice. Let's pray. Our Father, we do give you thanks for the power of your work in our lives. Lord, thank you that your word comes to us, not simply as human words, but with power, with deep conviction in the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, help each one of us to have confidence in our faith today. Lord, help us in those works prompted by our faith, our labour of love, our hope inspired by the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to walk with you day by day as we look forward to that great and glorious day when you return. Lord, if there are those here this morning who don't yet trust in you, Lord, I pray that your word would speak to them loudly and clearly, with Holy Spirit, deep conviction, Lord, so that they would know that hope in the last day. <coughs> Lord, we give all the glory to you. We give you thanks for saving us. We give you thanks for our wonderful salvation. And we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to uh, finish our time together this morning by singing together, There is a Hope.
咗，但係誒同我